Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Fire Engineering Talk Radio and another installment of the Professional Volunteer Fire Department. I am your host, Tom Merrill, and tonight is Tuesday, December 4th. And tonight I'm actually coming back to you live. If you remember back to the last show back in October, that was a little different there. I had to pre-record it uh, because I was doing some traveling and had some family things going on. So I had to pre-record the show. But tonight I'm back live with you. So that means, hey, I'm here to take your call. So if you uh, would like to call in and discuss things going on in your volunteer fire department or about our topic tonight, I'll give the number several times. But again, it's 760 760- Four five four eight eight five two. So feel free to call in, and I encourage you to do so, especially in light of tonight's very special guest. But um, before we get into tonight's topic, just again a couple housekeeping items. And hey, you know uh, something new came up for me today. I took a phone call, and I'm excited to announce that I'm going to be appearing tomorrow on Fire Engineering's Hump Day Hangout. Uh, that's at one o'clock. Uh, Eastern Time. I was invited to uh, to be on the panel tomorrow where we're going to talk about something that's really important, and you've heard me talk about it on this show quite a bit, and that's the importance of training drills and putting on good training programs in our volunteer fire service. There's going to be a panel on tomorrow discussing that, and I uh, was uh, honored to be asked to uh, appear on that, and I'm looking forward to it. So that's 1 o'clock tomorrow, and um, if you've never done a or watch the Hump Day Hangout. Uh, they're available via live stream, uh, stream on Google and YouTube. And uh, it be 1 o'clock tomorrow, and you can just go on Fire Engineering's website and look for the link to that. And I'm looking forward to it in a very important discussion on training and how important it is in the volunteer fire service and maybe talk about ideas to make our training programs uh, just a little bit better because it's, it's so important. And, hey, speaking of training, again, remember, FDIC 2019, yes, 2019, right around the corner and uh april uh in april it'll be uh, in indianapolis again and look forward to again participating in my class the professional volunteer fire department hopefully i can meet many of you there and uh, hopefully i'll see many of you in my class uh, again the uh, fdic april 8th to the 13th in indianapolis and uh, if you've never been there, I highly encourage you to go. It is the premier fire training event in the world. And if you're returning, you certainly know that's true. And people talk about the hardest part with that program or that uh, conference is too many good classes to choose from. So, and uh, if you've never been or your department might struggle to send people, remember for the fifth year in a row, Honeywell and DuPont. We'll again be offering all-expense-paid scholarships for 20 deserving first responders. All expenses paid, airfare, hotel registration, uh, food stipend. Just go to the FDIC homepage via Fire Engineering. At the top of the page, you'll see a a menu titled Awards, and there's a link to the scholarship. Um, So check it out because it is worth, so worth your attendance. And, folks, it is December 4th, and... The month of uh, December, traditionally in a lot of volunteer fire departments, means it's election time. Yes, the dreaded volunteer fire department election. And like it or not, it's reality in so many departments. There are some departments maybe that don't have elections that appoint chief officers and firematic officers and administrative officers. Some I know even have some examinations and you have to display competency in your SOPs, SOGs, and ways of doing things. And and that's great. But for so many volunteer fire departments, the volunteer fire department election is the way that officers are selected. And what I would like to ask is that if you are running, please run on merit. Run for office because you feel like you have something to offer your department. Run because you truly want to be a leader 
in your department, and you want to learn to work with all your members. Now, remember, they come in all different backgrounds, all different learning curves, all different personalities, and yes, accept the fact they're not all going to see things the way you do, but when you choose to be an officer, as an officer, you must somehow learn to work with them and motivate them and guide them. And if you're a firematic officer on the operations side, protect them. It's a very serious job that you're aspiring to do, a very serious job that requires you to take it seriously, and it comes with a tremendous amount of responsibility. It requires dedication on your part and requires hard work. Now, you certainly can choose to do the minimal amount. You can do nothing. Heck, you can't be fired in a volunteer fire department in most cases, so you can just sit back and do nothing. But if you want to earn and maintain the reputation as a competent, dedicated, and knowledgeable officer, you will pay honor to the title you wear or that you are aspiring to wear by keeping all this in mind. So I just want to wish everyone good luck out there if you're aspiring to be an officer. Maybe you were newly elected or reelected. That's great. Do your company proud. And one more thing, and it's really fitting for this week, and it's a fitting way to remember and honor our late President George H.W. Bush, number 41, who we passed away over the weekend. On, I think it was on Friday, and you probably heard the story, but it's really worth repeating here. And if you have not allowed, if you've not heard the story, please allow me to share it with you, because it's a story we can learn from. We can learn about losing with graciousness and maintaining class, even after suffering a bitter defeat, it stings to lose an election, no doubt about it. And maybe some listening tonight know that feeling, how hard it is, how it stings. I'm sure many of you listening tonight know too well the pain of losing that fire department election. But now imagine the pain, anger, perhaps even embarrassment of losing a presidential election especially as an incumbent. Yeah, no doubt, again, many listening tonight know what that feels like to be an incumbent chief or president or even a commissioner, only to lose in that re-election bid. Yet somehow, George Bush was able to put aside that pain. He was able to maintain his dignity and showcase class as he penned a quick note to welcome the incoming President Bill Clinton when he assumed the presidency. A note in which he pledged his support to the new president, a note in which he wished him nothing but success, and indeed a note that said, and I quote, I am rooting hard for you. Wow. We can all learn from that. We certainly can. A lesson in civility, of maintaining graciousness in the midst of defeat. And mind you, this was after a pretty bitter campaign, too, as we know political campaigns can certainly be. And so can fire department election campaigns as well, right? But there will be winners and there will be losers. And right or wrong, we must all still somehow band together and we must continue to serve and protect our communities. And doing it as united as possible, as one team, not wallowing in self-pity or anger, vindictiveness, certainly will pay huge dividends for the professional volunteer fire department. George said to Bill Clinton, your success now is our country's success. Perhaps we can say to our winners in our departments over the next month, your success is now our department's success. So rest in peace, Mr. President, and thank you for your lessons in civility, honor, and class, because we can all learn from that. And I think that would be a poignant reminder as we go into the month of December and into January in our roles as officers. And as we turn the calendar into this festive-filled month of December, I want to wish all of you a safe and happy holiday season Certainly a time to spend with your loved ones, your families, your friends, your co-workers. A great, joyful month, for sure. And we have so much to be thankful for. But in the American Fire Service, December is also a very scary month. And it's a month that we should sit back and spend some time to reflect on 
the horrendous and devastating fires that have occurred throughout history during the month of December. For example, the anniversary of Our Lady of Angels fire, which occurred on Monday, December 1st, so the anniversary was just a couple days ago, Monday, December 1st, 1958, where 92 children and four nuns were killed at the in the Chicago Fire Department, had unbelievable acts of heroism that day trying to mitigate that disaster. Just eight years ago, in the same city, two firefighters were killed in a collapse on the 100th anniversary of the Union Stockyard Fire that killed 21 Chicago firefighters 100 years before that. In my own city, Buffalo, New York, five Buffalo firefighters killed on December 27, 1983, when there was a horrific propane explosion. On December 20, 1991, four firefighters were killed in Brackenridge, Pennsylvania, in a partial floor collapse. 1999 was a year that most of us should remember because it was horrendous in December of 1999. First, we had the Worcester, Massachusetts fire at the cold storage warehouse on December 3rd. The anniversary was just yesterday. Six firefighter fatalities. And just a short time later, in December of 1999, Keokuk, Iowa, three firefighters, and three children perishing in a duplex fire. And unfortunately, in a sign of the very turbulent and unpredictable and honestly nasty times we live in today, December also sees the anniversary of the West Webster, New York, which is in the Rochester area, shooting on Christmas Eve, no less, tones dropping for a routine, a simple car fire. Arriving firefighters, however, met with a barrage of gunfire by a sick individual hiding behind a berm. Four firefighters were struck. Unfortunately, two were killed. Reminders all of the very real dangers and unpredictability of our job and of the tragic month of December. Not trying to be a downer at all or cast a negative feeling on what should be a joyful and fun month. But turn these tragedies into something that can help us all become better firefighters. For as we have often talked about on this show, there is so much to learn in the wake of these events. Lessons that we can apply in our departments. And by reading about these sacrifices, you know what we do? We honor these firefighters. We honor their sacrifice. We honor who they were. And we pay tribute to them. And we can all help protect a new generation of firefighters by passing on the lessons learned. For as often is often said, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And that is so true in war, it's true in politics, it's true in life, and it's certainly true in the fire service as well. And tonight to help us learn about some of these horrendous fires and tragic events and also share some great stories about our great fire service. I have the premier fire service historian on the show, Professor Glenn Corbett. I could listen to him talk for hours. I have listened to him talk for hours because he has so much information to share, incredible information, and I'm so honored to have him on because I've been trying for a couple of years now to get him on the show, and I'm so glad and appreciative that he has taken the time out of his extremely busy schedule to be with us here tonight and discuss how so many things that we do today and so many tools we use or expressions and just so many things we do today had their beginnings or somehow were influenced years ago, even in your own department. It's not just the big national or international fire service, mind you, but in your own department, and it's so important and we're going to talk about it tonight, that you understand that and pass that on to those coming after us. It's important to know where we come from, not just in the fire service, but in our own departments. So, Professor Corbett, I can't thank you enough for being here. A little bit of history of who he is. As said, he's the preeminent authority when it comes to fire service history, a walking encyclopedia for sure. And I've uh, been trying, like I said, to get him on for a couple of years now. 
He served as an assistant chief for the Waldwick, New Jersey Fire Department. He's a professor of fire science at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City, technical editor for fire engineering, co-author of the late Francis Brannigan's book, Building Construction for the Fire Service, an editor of Fire Engineering's Handbook. He's an FDIC advisory board member. He teaches at FDIC. If you've never had a chance to sit on his class or talk to him, I highly encourage you to do that. And speaking of which, I'm going to beat him up a little bit tonight because class several years ago at FDIC with Chief Rick Lasky called Tradition, Tradition, and that class focused on our fire service history and why we should know where we come from. And it was an incredible class, and I'm going to lobby him along with Chief Lasky, to bring that class back again. But again, Chief, Professor, thank you so much for being here tonight. I can't thank you enough for taking the time out to be here. Oh, thanks so much, Tom. I really appreciate being on your program. Uh, And for your listeners, I didn't pay Tom for that that introduction, so I really appreciate it. It's uh, (laughs) it's an honor to be on your program and uh, looking forward to Talking, uh, talking history tonight, and whatever else you think uh, might be of interest. So, oh, I got uh, um, a lot of great ideas for tonight because there's just so much to okay. talk about when it comes to history. And um, you know, I mentioned that class tradition, tradition that that you did with Chief Lasky, and uh, I am going to keep bringing that up because I think it was such an important class to to offer and had so much great information. But maybe we could start off just even with that real quick. What led to you putting that class together with Chief Lasky? Did you see a need for it? Did you see our history escaping us? Yeah, I think um, that's exactly what happened. Uh, I've known Rick for a long time, and uh, as most of your listeners know, Rick, Rick, of course, um, is, is the is – the, when you think of pride and ownership, that's his book. That's That's the message that he professes. Uh, in lectures all across the country, is a, a great demand talking about sort of the, you know, the reason why we do what we do. So, um, and so he and I have been talking over years, and, you know, we share an interest in history, and history is sort of the glue that to some extent binds um, the issues of pride and ownership in the fire service. So if, if you have pride in, and you have ownership in, the, in your fire department or in the fire service, a lot of that has to do with where we've been, you know, where we've come from. And so he and I uh, talked about it for a while, and we sort of came up with this concept of uh, uh, of having an FDIC class. And it's kind of funny because, um, you know, originally we had sort of different ideas on how to do this. And so uh, we decided, uh, again, it was probably 10 years ago, I guess we did it at, at FDIC. Um, we sort of changed the focus a little bit in which we had Rick come out um, and sort of address the audience as if they were new recruits in the fire department. Um, and uh, it was it was it was impressive and it was kind of funny at the same time. I remember um, again this is ten years ago, but I can remember talking to Rick before we went out, and they noticed there was a guy who was, for example, sitting up near the front front row. <laughs> I guess he was texting or whatever. He was on his phone for a while, and as Rick came out he was talking and Rick noticed the guy was still texting or doing something on his phone. So of course Rick uh, directed his, his, um, his uh, presentation right to that fellow in the front row. Wow. And uh, basically said, you know, Hey, you know, you're a recruit here. You need to pay attention. This is important stuff. And, and so it just, it was very organic. Um, It was very um, sort of, uh, you know, sort of from the bottom up type approach to, to dealing with this issue. And so, um, you know, we felt that, you know, there's something, there was something missing in the last several years, at least in our own experiences that, um, you know, I've been in the fire service since 1978 and, uh, of course, as a volunteer and, uh, um, have seen changes in the fire service. If your listeners who have been around a while, remember the days in the seventies and eighties, uh, what the volunteer fire service looked like compared to where it is today. And, things have certainly changed. I mean, the type of people we have today is much different. There was a lot of more family members perhaps back then. Uh, today, it's a, you know, it's a different cross-section of folks out there. And, of course, there's all a variety of issues that we had back then that we don't have anymore, but there's also new issues we didn't have back then. So uh, one of the things that we felt that was really important and we seemed to be, we seemed to be losing it was our appreciation for where we've been before, you know, and where where we've come historically. So, 
um, that was sort of the genesis of uh, creating that class. Um, I, you know, we're going to bring it back again. I almost did it this year, and uh, um, I, I sort of had to step back from it for a moment. We're, we're going to be actually be coordinating a, a, a panel discussion on lightweight construction this year. We felt that it was important to have that, but we'll bring back that traditions class. Um, and one of the things we did, one final point on is that one of the things we did is um, when we created the firefighter handbook for firefighter one and two, uh, six, seven years ago, um, I said, you yeah, know, this is something that, that we've got to incorporate into the book. So um, we decided, and this is a, this is a kind of a cool thing uh, when you're, when you're putting a book together and particularly a book case, fire engineering books had never done before, which is a, again, a fire one, fire two handbook, you know, the slate is clean. You can do whatever you want, you know. Um, you can sort of do what you believe is the appropriate approach as opposed to sort of doing sort of, you know, changing from one edition to the next. But you got to face a clean slate. So what we decided to do is, is incorporate two chapters at the very beginning of the book. Um, the first chapter is the mission of the fire service, and that's Rick's chapter, and he talks about why we do with what we do. And then the second chapter uh, was or is a chapter on fire service history. They, they go together. And so Don Cannon, the late Don Cannon, uh, wrote that book. Some of your listeners might remember, might have on their shelf, a book called Heritage of Flames. Uh, it was put out in the 70s. It was one of the best sort of early fire service history uh, books out there. Um, and we lost him a few years ago. He ended up, uh, he lives he lived not too far from me, and he, I actually brought him over as an adjunct professor at John Jay College, and he taught a class in fire called Fire in New York. It was all, it was a semester-long class, and all we, all we talked about was fires in New York City and how they changed uh, the city itself, how the city changed, uh, as, of course, as a result of these fires, but the FDNY and all sorts of other things, and it was an incredibly popular class. So Don did the, did the history book chapter for fire for the firefighter one firefighter two book and we felt that it was so important that we put it in there if you look at nfpa 1001 which is of course the standard for fire service training for you know basic firefighter training um you'll know there's no mention of fire of history or sort of mission or anything in there so but we felt it was that important to do it and so what we included it in there and so i have one last point um you know part of that book include you know part of producing that book and the associated products we created a dvd of video clips for training how to tie a you know bowling knot how to raise a 35 foot ladder you know how to stretch a size hose line there's there's a couple hundred videos of that but we also included a video of the famous um rick lasky presentation called there's the door okay mm -hmm. <laughs> and basically that was that traditions class. That's what we called it was there's the door because basically what Rick was trying to get across to these, again, very experienced guys that were in the audience at FDIC that year. These were not new recruits, but he was trying to make a point that we need to sort of indoctrinate new folks coming in, that this is a different job than any job perhaps they'll ever ha have had or ever will have. Uh, it's yeah. got a different history. It's got a different philosophy. And so, this there's the door speech basically was an advocate you know he was basically advocating for look if you if you want to be a firefighter you've got to sort of buy into these issues and you've got to buy into uh, our traditions to a great extent and um, if that's not for you then you know there's the door so basically yeah. uh, it's something that we got to, again I think people really enjoyed it and uh, and Tom looking forward to bringing it back again maybe next year um, because there's a new group of people at FDSC have never seen it and I think it's it's something that they can take home to their own fire department to think about and you know I can't say how many people including yourself Tom we've had conversations about these issues and stuff and how uh, some folks have been able to create their own sort of little mini history program that they that they provide for new recruits coming into the, into their own fire department that is customized to their own local history you know yeah. So anyway, so that's important. that's where that's where this stuff started, and so um, I'm glad to be part of it. And uh, I think it's something that we've needed for a while, and I think so many departments have sort of embraced it and uh, and sort of you know uh, are including again including that in sort of their not only the recruit programs but also to try to get some of the more older folks that are in the fire department engaged with these issues. So. Yeah, it's so important, you know. Um, I, I've mentioned this before on my show before, but every now and then people will call me to help them 
uh, put uh, history together of their department because they have a 75th or 100th anniversary coming up, and and um, I'm known as a passionate historian, and I love fire service history and um, working on my own departments. And so I love to help other people out, but it amazes me when you start talking to people that they don't even have a beginning point. It's There's not even a story written down of where it started and where it evolved from. You're starting from scratch because, oh, my gosh, it's gone. It's lost. So, yeah, it's so important that we stop today and start somewhere recording your history because it's tough to catch up once you lose it. And it's just so important. Right, and that's, and that's, and that's, that's a critical piece because, again, the fire service is changing. You know, the people that we're bringing in, a lot of them don't have sort of a, uh, a family relationship to the fire service where some of these stories are passed down from one generation to the next. They're brand new to the fire service. So they have, we're trying to get them in a position to understand that they're joining something that has, uh, has, a, has a very long history. You know, the fire service existed before there was the United States here in the U.S. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's got a long, long history. And, of course, it starts with volunteer fire departments, right? It's Ben Franklin that starts the very first fire company in, in Philly in 1736 to sort of get the ball rolling. And uh, we've been rolling ever since, you know. And it's important that, again, that I think that, that particularly young people have – not only understand the history, but take some pride in that. that that's something they can be proud of, that uh, that the volunteer firefighter has, has been around for a very long time and continues to try to, you know, change, morph, modify, you know, all these kind of things that we all do nowadays to try to adapt to uh, the changing environment that we're in, you know, and uh, you know, we've been successful so, with that, you know. Yeah, so, and you, so let's, let's, let's do that. Let's Let's uh, go back a little bit here, um, because I think one thing that's easily overlooked today when when you talk to new firefighters is they can't grasp just what a very real threat fire was back in the day, back in colonial America, back predating colonial America. Like it was, it impacted everything. I mean, their very livelihood, their their survival. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the first English settlement in Jamestown, didn't that burn the ground within the first year of uh, of the settlers coming to Jamestown? Yep, and it's, and, and it's been happening and ever then, since. Yep. And then in Manhattan, if if my history serves, I, I think it was a trader ship burned, forcing the crew to row ashore in present-day Manhattan. So fire played such a role uh, in, in so many things, but it was such a real threat. And so when when the first settlers came over, they brought with them maybe the little bit of knowledge they had of fire protection and from where they came from, which in a lot of cases was England. But it was up to bucket brigades, wasn't it, to, to try and put out right. fires if they occurred. And, and they did occur with some very tragic results. Yep, and... You know, I teach a class. Uh, I had told at FDIC, that's where I developed a, a class out there called, the, you know, basically the 25 most significant fires in American history. And so it's kind of tough to, to narrow it down to 25 fires, but, uh, you know, we did it. And um, one of the the first slide I started off with, and I, I still teach this class in New Jersey for uh, inspector and instructor recertification. So um, the very first slide I have is a, is a, a slide of, which is a, a panoramic view of London burning in 1666. And of course, I asked the uh, attendees, I go, does anybody know where this fire was? And some of them do, but most of them don't. And you know, it's it's. I, and I said the reason I put this photograph or this picture up here of London is because it's that fire that becomes a turning, a major turning point in sort of globally on how we deal with fires because it's after that fire that we get organized fire departments we get equipment we get the first fire engines we get the first fire hose i mean we get a lot of things that come out of that fire and of course as you just mentioned um all of that we call it we call it technology with quotes all that technology is transported here to the united states so we here in the u.s buy equipment that's built in london so the very first engine that New York City, two engines New York City buys are new shim engines. And if anybody, and this is a, this is a, 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 a pro bono commercial for the New York State uh, Fireman's Home uh, and the New York State Fire Museum up in Hudson, New York. If any of your listeners happen to be 
uh, in the Catskill area, um, and they have an opportunity. They need to go to the – it used to be called the American Museum of Firefighting. Actually, I like that name better, so we'll call it that. The American Museum mm-hmm. of Firefighting, it has the most incredible collection, in my mind, of any in the world, basically, that I'm familiar with. It has the largest collection of American apparatus in it, over 200 pieces of apparatus. And what's really interesting is they have in that collection one of New York City's very first two engines they ever bought in 1731. So you could see wow. the range of apparatus. And, it's, and, and, of course, you look at it today and see what kind of fire could this thing put out because it's incredibly small. But you know what? It was the start of a much larger effort to build better equipment. And so that fire, as you point out, you know, for the settlers coming over here, they had to, you know, they learned things. They learned about firewalls, for example, right? It's a 1666 fire that we get the first firewalls with parapets on it. And, Tom, I was just in a meeting earlier in the week uh, with a state senator here in New Jersey and uh, a group of folks, we'll call them, um, it would be a proper term. I'll call them people who are not really uh, endorsing improved fire protection. Let's put it that way. The folks from the architecture field. And, you know, one of the things that come up was this issue of firewalls. And, um, you know, we learned stuff 300 years ago, you know, or more than that, uh, with this London fire that masonry firewalls uh, with parapets on top actually work. They do work well. And so... Here we are talking here. I'm in a meeting earlier in this week, and here I'm talking about a technology that was developed, you know, over 300 years ago, and it still works, right. you know. So, but of yeah. course, yeah. Our, right, our problem is that, you know, our building codes, unfortunately, uh, allow uh, gypsum board, for example, things like that, and without parapets. And so we've lost, we've lost some, you know, some useful technology that worked for us for a long time. And so... Uh, wow. And that's another reason why we teach people these things. Uh, we teach people. We teach new firefighters, new recruits these things because, in a lot of cases, we've been there before. We've learned things, yeah. and that's one of the things that one of those classes that not just lessons learned, but lessons forgotten, lessons unlearned, basically. Because that's what happens with our history, right? So yeah, it, 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 right. It goes back again to what I said earlier in the show and what Winston Churchill said in 1948. Those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. And exactly what you described there is exactly what's going on. It's right. It's right. it's maddening. But so even before the first engine, though, the, the settlers or the colonial America and colonial America it wasn't. It was buckets, right? Weren't wasn't every right. homeowner required, or wasn't the pressure on them to have buckets available? to uh right, to be lasted, on hand in case there was a fire. Yeah, and that lasted actually well into the nineteenth century. You know, as as the bigger cities sort of abandoned that, the smaller cities still required it right up through the late parts of the nineteenth century. You had basically leather buckets which were made available each for each homeowner, for example, have two of them if you're a factory or commercial building, maybe you had a few more. But basically, it was to sort of move the water from the well, and that's what we had. We didn't have hydrants. We didn't have water mains. We didn't have reservoirs. We had wells, and it was from those wells that we actually put fires out. And, of course, you can imagine, it, you know, it's it, that would have been an ISO 10 rating, right? So basically, <laughs> not not very effective, you know, because, again, you think about a bucket, how far can you throw a gallon and a half of water? Not very far. And so most buildings just burn to the ground, and... It was it was as effective as it could be, and that's why as cities got as cities developed. I mean, you got more urbanization, you got buildings built closer together, um, and and taller, and you needed to have something better. And so that you know, as they as they say, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. I mean, that's why we get engines that can pump water a yeah. distance through a nozzle, so you, maybe you can hit a second floor window with water. Which a, with a bucket you can never do that. So it, it just in these it, buckets, it's a whole you, evolution process. Right. You see these buckets every now and then in in museums or in uh, right. online sometimes even being sold. They were some of them were pretty intricately detailed and, and decorated, right? Didn't they? Because then at the end of the fire they throw them in a pile and then you had to go find your bucket. Yep, and you have to have your name on it. And so the simplest one just had your simple a simple name on it, but. Uh, if you had a few extra bucks, you hired like a, a guy up in Boston, the famous Boston maker, his name is Fenno, F-E-N-N-O. Uh, I was fortunate several years ago to find one in an antique shop up there. It's stamped in the side, in the seam of the bucket. Uh, he had more, some more of the more extravagant ones, which had incredible 
paintings of a variety of things. Of course, mostly fires, but other kinds of things on the front of buckets. So, um, so yeah, they were not only utilitarian, but they were also pieces of artwork. And of course, our friends that collect folk art have glommed onto them and buy them at high prices because they're mm-hmm. pieces of art, basically. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, wow. the, the most basic is your name and maybe a number. That's it. So. But if you had the money, you, you threw some money at an artist to throw some really incredible paintings on it. And it was just expected that if there was a fire, men, women, children, wasn't it was everyone, yep. hey, everyone got to help. But if memory serves from my history knowledge, didn't a term come out of this era that there's always someone in, in the fire service and in the public in general that if they can skirt doing any work, they're going to they're gonna sneak around to work. And didn't didn't some term we still use today come from that when when somebody maybe wasn't participating to the full extent? Well, and, and basic... Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, that term, that I, I hear it in my own firehouse, we call that person a slacker. Right, a slacker. Right, exactly. And, you know, as time went on, um, you know, we, you know at, at the very beginning of the creation of what we would call a fire department, basically, um, you know, these were legal reasons for, for being a firefighter as, a, as, a, as opposed to a, being a regular citizen who, you know, once we got away from the bucket brigades and we went to organized fire departments, um, you know, it was, it was in the context of a legal structure of, of being a member and participating and doing everything you need to do, right? So the slackers, um, yeah, and you know this too, I mean, I, a lot of fire departments across the country um, you know, as a volunteer fire department, you take attendance, you know, how many guys are showing up and who's doing what and stuff. And, uh, and yeah, so you have some members who maybe are more interested in, we'll call it the back room or the social part of the fire department as opposed to the more active front end of the fire department <clears throat> in the apparatus floor. So, uh, yeah, it's a delicate balance that we still deal with today, right? Um, yeah, it is a yeah, effort, for sure. Right? It's a group effort. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, no. So, as you mentioned, then this led to the evolution or of uh, pumpers, and uh, I think it was Boston got the first uh, fire engine, and um, didn't they have to carry it? Yeah, because was it on legs or something? It had no wheels on it. It was carried by legs. Now, why <laughs> you would develop a fire engine with no wheels on it? I don't get that. I still to this day I have a model of it. Uh, there was a man out in California who uh, I just saw him online recently. I think he's since passed away, but. This incredible artist who built these wooden models back in the 80s of stagecoaches, but he also did a bunch of fire engines, and that was one of them, is the the bo- very first Boston fire engine, and it was basically carried by four people, and it had legs and no wheels on it. And, of course, the deal with these early engines was is that you had to fill them with water, okay? All they were was a pump that you could pump water out of a reservoir on the engine itself. So that Massachusetts Boston engine... Um, they just basically filled it up with water, and the pump literally just pushed the water. The piston pump just pushed the water out of the nozzle. Um, the Newsham engine that I mentioned earlier is in this early 1700s. Again, the one that's in a, a real one that's in existence up there in Hudson, New York. Um, that's also a piston pumper, but it was a little bit more elaborate because one of the things they figured out was in a piston pumper, a piston flow. You know, you think about how if you're Listeners, I think most people are familiar how they work, but but it literally is a piston that goes up and down and pushes water through the pump and out the nozzle. Well, the problem, of course, was that um, unless you provided this important piece called the condenser, okay, you effectively had this this pumper, and that's the, the Boston engine was just like that. You pump up, you know, you pump it, but at the same time it would come out in squirts of water. It wouldn't be a continuous stream of water. So it was a kind of an odd situation, and so it wasn't too much longer after that they figured out they needed this, this, this effectively a pressure vessel inside the pump to take the water coming out of the pistons and balance it so that you get this more continuous stream of water coming out. But the bottom line, Tom, was that it had to be filled by hand, and in some cases filled with these buckets again. They used buckets yeah. to fill the engine up. So Man. we haven't gotten rid of buckets yet in the 1700s. Still got them. Yeah, I wonder if they had physical fitness programs back then because, my gosh, I can't imagine how exhausting that that must have well, been for, for everybody. Important 
point because there was one engine, Tom, at the far end of the uh, – so we're talking hand pump, and these are hand pump engines using these these uh, pieces of wood, these these poles of wood on the side that go up and down. We call them brakes, okay? Brakes, literally, if you pull down, the piston went up on the other side. You pushed up, the piston went up on your side. So it's like it went back and forth on these two brakes either side of the engine to literally create – uh, this this uh, energy to propel the water out of the nozzle. Well, one of the things is, Tom, that 1731 engine up there in New York, if you can get six guys on it, you're probably lucky. So it's at least two, probably three on each side, two or three on each side, and you can pump that engine. The worst, the worst one, I don't think the worst one, the most difficult one is at the other end of the spectrum when hand engines started going out. It's hard to believe that New York City had a volunteer fire department with six or 7,000 volunteer firemen. Can you imagine that? Um, in, which, in which it wasn't until about eight, in the late 1850s when the very first steam engines came in. They had an engine uh, for Engine 42, the Empire Engine Company, that required 60 men to pump it. Okay, 6 zero. Okay, it was called 60? the man killer. 60 men? Yeah, and it, right. It was called the man killer, and it... It was just that, a man killer, and it was the heaviest hand engine ever built, okay? It was so heavy that the 40, engine 42 finally gave it up. They could, not, they could not get enough people together to pump this thing. Now, of course, there's a reason why you like hand engines as opposed to steamers, right? You like hand engines because they require lots of people to, to pump them. A steam engine, Tom, how many guys do you need for that? You need a stoker, you need a driver. Uh, you need a couple other people and probably four or five people and a couple guys in the hose. You can you can operate that pumper, including the hose line, with less than ten people. Okay. Yeah, so uh, that could lead to cutback. You just like thirty even back so then. You can imagine. Okay, you can imagine these volunteers just looking at these steam engines, saying, "Hey, I don't want that. It's, it's more fun to pump these things." The only problem with those hand engines is that you would last for three or four minutes with those brakes going up and down on either side of that engine. Up and down twice in a minute, excuse me, in a second. That thing is flying up and down, those brakes, okay? Mm-hmm. And you get a powerful stream out. These streams that we have musters today, in which they actually measure the length of the stream. And these will go two or 300 feet uh, down, you know, down yard, down in a, in a, on a football field. You get two or 300 feet out of them. So they're pretty powerful engines, it's just that they're, they're enormous, you know, uh, difficult to pump over a long period of time. You're not going to yeah. pump it for four or five hours straight with, <laughs> the same group of 60 people. Okay. It's no. not going to happen. <laughs> no. So anyway, it's, it's uh. an interesting concept, Tom. Right. Interesting concept. Yeah, for sure. Now tell us a little bit about this uh, father of the American Fire Service because there's some misconceptions with them. And, but he's generally talking about the great Ben Franklin, generally recognized as, you know, starting the first volunteer fire department in America. And it's used, I guess 1736 is always used as the benchmark for the beginning of the American Fire Service. So Ben did so much and is so involved in American history. How do you get involved in the fire service and, and take us down that road? Right. So, you know, we talked about the 1666 fire in London, and that is a that is the precipitating event to do a lot of things, equipment we talked about, but there's also – precipitating event to actually create organized fire departments, except over in London, those those fire departments were organized by insurance companies, okay? So there was no municipal London fire brigade in 1667 or 1668. There were basically individual insurance companies who, who effectively had their own fire department, their own fire brigade with their own equipment, and they basically protected their buildings. Okay, uh, that were protected, you know, the, the, by the insurance policyholders, the, the people uh, who paid for that. So that's how the system works. So here we get to the U.S. Ben Franklin, of course, in the in the uh, in the early uh, 18th century, is inventing everything known to mankind. <laughs> Basically, he's evolving all these different things, right? But he's also figures out that hey, look, Philadelphia, you know, Philadelphia is larger than New York at that point. Um, it's growing rapidly. There's lots of people moving there. Buildings are getting taller and bigger. And here we are with bucket brigades, and it's pretty much disorganized, okay? There's not a lot of organization. So he says, look, we need to have a neighborhood group here that of friends, we'll call them friends, in which we will band together as a group to help each other out. So if a fire breaks out in our house, in one of our houses, we'll have the equipment to, to put it out. 
uh, you know, to deal with it, basically. So he organizes that very first, we'll call it a volunteer company, because these people weren't paid. They were simply homeowners who banded together to provide their own fire company. And, of course, this idea literally caught on like fire, wildfire. And so after Ben starts his union fire company, other fire companies are created in Philadelphia, and they sort of move away from, like, okay, you know, uh, if it's a Fairmount Engine Company or uh, the um, Hand in Hand, which is an early, a very early one. I think it was maybe the second one after Ben's company, the Hand in Hand. Those, they start to evolve over time in which uh, they became sort of not only for their own members, but also became more of neighborhood fire companies, right? So if the hand-in-hand -hand engine, you know, in their immediate neighborhood there was a fire, they would respond to it and they would put it out. But again, hmm. we're pretty much early on here. We don't really have engines yet. Um, you know, the, the, the American fire engine industry is just starting. A guy by the name of Lyons, L-Y-O-N-S, is one of the earliest makers of fire engines here in the U.S., and he starts in Philadelphia. So we get our first American-made fire engines in Philly. That's really kind of where it starts. So... So Ben sets off this whole sort of system in motion, but the general concept of neighbors banding together to protect themselves against fire voluntarily is what you and I are doing with today, Tom. Okay, it's a, it looks yeah. a little different, but it's basically the same concept. You know, God knows how, how many years later now, four hundred years later, three hundred <laughs> some years and, later. So. And it was looked upon as an honorable thing to do. So many of our early movers and shakers and. Uh, yep. Famous names in American history served as volunteer firefighters, and uh, yep. I believe Paul Revere and John Hancock, and even I know it might be controversial. Maybe you know more about this than me. I was in, uh, I went to Mount Vernon this summer to see Washington's yes. house, and and went into Old Town there, and uh, there was some controversy about whether George Washington was actually a member of, of was it the Friendship Fire Company or what was yeah, the name? Of it? But they, he, uh, yeah, and. I think I think I mean I'd have to do a little more research myself, but I believe what it's agreed upon now was that he was interested in fire protection, no doubt about that. He actually uh, purchased their engine for them. I don't know that he ever got on those brakes and started pumping though. That I don't believe. I think the argument is that he probably didn't do that. But we have to give him credit because he recognized the need for fire protection, and yeah. um, he stepped up and. He was philanthropic enough to help them acquire that very first engine that they bought. So we'll, we'll still call him a firefighter. He was the, he was okay. the father of, you know. <laughs> I think we can agree on that. So Yeah, yeah, and it's just it was so honorable for people to do it. And, again, when you yep. look through the annals of history, so many people yep. did, did serve as volunteers. And but yeah. I, uh, while we're on – while we're on Ben Franklin, I, I just want to get your take on this. I heard you talk about it once, and I want you to share it with our listeners. The famous picture or drawing of Ben Franklin with the fire helmet, which uh, I think uh, you say that fire helmet didn't come for many years after his death, correct? <laughs> right, right. So, And Philly actually didn't use that in their volunteer fire service anyway. So, yeah, there's a famous painting uh, that actually hangs now in the Philadelphia Fire Museum, Ben Franklin wearing – what we would call what's called a high eagle helmet. So it's a basically a leather helmet with an eight inch helmet front in the in the front. So today's world, if you have a leather fire helmet from Cairns, it's probably a five and a quarter inch or five inch, maybe four inch helmet front. Uh, those back in those days were eight eight inches. But when I say those days, I'm talking 19th century, not 18th century. So it, that painting basically is famous of Ben, but again, it was painted well over 100 years after he, he was gone, basically. So they put it on there because, to tell you the truth, he probably, in those earliest of days, they didn't have, they just had a regular hat. They had nothing spectacular um, back when he started that fire company. However, Philadelphia is is well known for their volunteer fire department, which you can start it in 1736 with Ben, and you ended in 1871 with the creation of their paid career fire department. But during those intervening years, Philadelphia uh, created this incredible regalia in terms of their PPE, we'll call it, which consisted of a, to some extent, pressed felt stovepipe hat like Abraham Lincoln would wear with a leather or, again, a lightweight pressed felt cape that they would put over their shoulders. And what's unique about them is they weren't just black and red, 
they had incredible artwork on those as well, and they command oh, wow. incredible prices today. I mean, if you get one that's in good shape, it's going to cost you twenty or twenty-five thousand dollars for a stove pot in Philadelphia. So, no uh, kidding. It's it, yeah, th- and they do come up for sale from time to time. There's a doctor in Pennsylvania who has a very—I don't know why he's interested in American in Philadelphia Fire Department, but he has the largest collection in the country. He's got dozens of them, um, and they're on display. Uh, about well, seven, eight years ago, I guess it was, at the Philadelphia Antique Show. It was a stellar exhibit. I mean, it, the, the amount of, and of course, the other thing we point should make at, make here is that a lot of the artists uh, in Philadelphia who we would know today, one one name is Sully. Sully, uh, Thomas Sully was a famous portrait artist. He was a volunteer firefighter who also painted these hats as well. So you've got, you know, uh, top-tier artists painting these hats that they would wear, and they were very unique. The only other places that used them were pretty much Baltimore, Delaware, and even St. Louis used them. Um, they're not; it, it never got beyond that. Most of the cities, like Boston, used regular, more traditional leather helmets, like New York did as well. And then I just one last point about about the artists in New York City. Um, a lot of your Hudson Valley artists were also volunteer firemen. One of, one guy did a lot of research on years ago for the Fire Museum in Hudson. Uh, the guy by the name of James Johnson. Johnson was a member of America's Engine 6, the Boss Tweed Fire Company with the tiger symbol in Manhattan. He painted uh, their engine. He also painted paint, it it created paintings of their engine on parade and all sorts of other stuff. And mm. like I said, he was a professional artist who was also a volunteer fireman. So artist, wow. artistry and firefighting go together, Tom. Yeah, fascinating. And, you know, while we're on helmets, how did we get to the traditional helmet that seems to have been around for so long? And um, was it was that Gratacap? Was that how you pronounce it? Was he the kind of figured to be the founder of the modern style helmet? There was a guy before him called Jacobus Turk who was a uh, was the chief engineer. That's why we still use the word chief engineer, like an L.A. City Fire Department uses, I think, that term of chief of department, because he was the chief of the engines, right? That's And they mm-hmm. called the fire chief chief engineers back then. And he, Jacobus Turk is credited with creating the first leather fire helmet. It's it's uh, Henry T. Gratacap, uh, who in the early 19th century sort of perfects the design of that helmet where we get what we call the combs, which are those those raised seams on the helmet. Uh, and, of course, the most important part of it is the helmet frontispiece, or front that we call it on the front, that identifies the fire company or the fire officer. Um, and it's it's Gratacap who creates that whole industry, really, in New York City. Uh, there were other makers in New York. Uh, Wilson was another maker. And there were some others in the 19th century that were just as popular. But it's Gratacap to remember the most because it's Gratacap who sells his business to the two brothers' Cairns. And, of course, we know them today. They're part of MSA now, but uh, it's the Cairns uh, brothers who actually buy the business from Gratacap. So we can say that even to this day that Cairns has a lineage back uh, to the 1830s, basically. Wow. Uh, 1836. And, so, and you um, talked and again, about the helmet fronts. The, right. Those have been around. Those uh, the white for officer, red for truck company. Those were right. also around since. And so, if you were to look at a New York City volunteer volunteer fire department helmet front, um, the latter companies are red. The leather was red. If you had an engine company, uh, they were black. If you had a hose company, they were black. But the the trucks were red, and the um, hose and engines were, were black. The officers uh, had gold leaf. Uh, if you're a chief officer, if you were a uh, company officer, a foreman or assistant foreman, a captain or a lieutenant, uh, they had the white helmet front as we do today. So the same helmet fronts that we use today are the same ones that we used back then. And wow. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm fortunate I've, I've been able to, add, you know, to get some of these uh, helmet fronts. And uh, I'll tell you a quick story. Several years ago at auction, I bought a, a chief officer's helmet front. It's in decent shape. Um, 
It has, it says system engineer on it, and it's got the initials on the bottom, and it's got a hand engine painted in the center. And when I looked at it, I thought, boy, oh, boy, that looks like Jefferson Engine 26. It had, they were called the Blue Boys. It had a very specific specific look to their engine. And as a matter of fact, that engine is on display up in Hudson, New York. So I looked at this helmet front, and I said, God, it looks just like that engine. Well, I got home, did the research, found out that the, there was an assistant engineer that matched the initials on the bottom of the helmet front, and by I just it sealed it with me. When I looked him up, I did the research, I found out that uh, as most, as all those officers did back then, if you were a chief, assistant chief engineer or chief engineer, of course you came from a fire company as an officer. So you were a captain, uh, or we would call a foreman back then, you got promoted. Well, anyway, that fellow who I believe, I believe it's his helmet front, was the assistant ch as chief engineer in charge of the village of Harlem, the village of Harlem, uh, in the 1860s. And when I saw what engine company he came from, it, it sealed the deal. He came from Pocahontas Engine 49, which turns out they were the recipients of the Jefferson 26 hand engine when Jefferson 26 was given a steam fire engine. So it wow. made all the sense of the world to me when I saw that. So anyways, it's wow. interesting to research. Connecting the dots. Thing, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, um, so yeah. So we again to this day we continue the traditions. And so, you know, if, if fellows wonder why chiefs are white and helmet fronts for officers are white, and why they're gold leaf for chiefs officers and helmet fronts, and why fire truck companies wear red and engines wear black, that can go. You can go right back to the to 1811, I believe is. I have to check it, but I believe it was 1811 when New York City established the rules for helmets and helmet fronts, and it starts right there, and we continue to oh, play in a lot of places. Fascinating. And even eagles on the front of the helmet, that, that goes back there, too. I know from time to time, I think they used other animals, um, but yeah. eagles traditionally have been the main helmet front holder, correct? Right. Eagles were the primary one, but uh, if you are if you like collecting old helmets, you'll find out there were other, other type brass, and these are brass, metal holders. They actually... Braddockhaft's first, um, Braddockhaft's first helmets, right up until the World's Fair in the late 1850s in Manhattan. The World's Fair, the very first American World's Fair, was held in Manhattan, where today Bryan Park is located, right beyond the New York Public Library. So that was a gigantic. They called it the Crystal Palace, and for that ex exhibition, Braddockhaft created the very first metal helmet front holder, and it was an eagle. Um, but prior to that, they were actually made of leather. They were leather eagles. But uh, if you look around, you'll find helmet front holders that were uh, of other things, seahorses, whippets, um, roosters were used up in Rhode Island, and our friends to the north, another very rare helmet front holder is the beaver. The Canadians, Montreal, those folks use the beavers up there in Canada. So uh, you'll find, uh, again, pythons, uh, you'll find all sorts of brass helmet folders. Those are much more rare, but the Eagle by far was the most uh, widely used. And, of course, Tom, you know, the Eagles came back. Cairns brought the Eagle back maybe 15 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a short mm -hmm. Eagle now, but it, it, that Eagle is a throwback. Ah, incredible, incredible. And, Glenn, I just want to take a minute to remind our listeners that uh, – they're listening to Fire Engineering Talk Radio and tonight's episode of the Professional Volunteer Fire Department. And I'd like to thank again our sponsor, Honeywell and DuPont, um, who again will be offering uh, all expenses paid scholarships to FDIC for 20 deserving first responders. Thank you very much for that. And tonight we are talking with Professor Glenn Corbett, who is the connoisseur of all things fire service history. And I have some more questions. Are you still okay on time? I don't want to keep you yeah, what if we, you've got what anywhere we else to be. Cause, yeah. Pardon no, me? What we do about another 15 minutes? We'll do another 15 minutes. And if we've got more left over, we'll do a part two. How's that? So, Excellent. Um, I could talk that. to you about all night about this. But I, I do want to get into a couple quick things. Then. Sure. Um, I heard you talk about this before. Can you talk about because a lot of people have these. I have one on my front porch by my front door, the fire mark, the insurance marker. Yes. And yes. this myth that if you didn't have that, they would let your house burn to the ground. What are these fire marks all about? Right, right. So um, we, we talked about 1666. We talked about the London fire, and we talked about how the London 
fire insurance companies created their own fire brigades. Well, they needed a, a mechanism to identify buildings that they protected. And that's where the fire mark is invented, is in London. And so there are literally hundreds and hundreds of different designs of fire marks in London that were used. What happens here in the U.S. is Ben Franklin, as we talked about before, creates that very first fire company in 1736. It's also around the same time that the very first fire insurance companies here in the U.S. are being created. The Insurance Company of North America, one of the oldest ones, the INA, who insured buildings against fire and ships against maritime disasters, you would know them today as Cigna, Connecticut General INA. And Cigna is, was created from the Amer insurance company of North America in Philly. It goes back into the 1700s. So what they did back then was create fire marks. That so you've got one, I've got one, Tom. A lot of listeners have them on their houses. They're incredible pieces of artwork, but they are actually more advertising than anything else. And so there's been this myth out there that that these fire marks in the United States were somehow tied to a fire company deciding whether or not to put the fire out in your building or not. But since we didn't have the sort of European London approach to things, we, we just basically banded together in neighborhood groups. Those fire marks, which, which were very prevalent in Philly and, again, Baltimore in that area, not in so much in New York, but Philly and Baltimore are the two big cities that fire marks. Um, those were really signs of, uh, of the insurance companies for purposes of, of advertisement. So if you, for example, were in Philadelphia and you saw the Green Tree uh, fire mark or you saw the FA for the Firemen's Association fire mark or the UF United Firemen's Association, and there's all these different insurance companies that were based particularly in Philly but also New York and other places, but let's talk about Philly that create these incredible fire marks. Now, were they useful for a fire company? Yeah, I'll tell you why. Because at the end of the year, a lot of these insurance companies did cut a check to a fire company if they knew that they were being, if they were being helped by the new company. So we have records of some of the volunteer fire companies in Philadelphia getting uh, some donations from the insurance companies, realizing that, uh, that the insurance companies appreciated the efforts that these volunteer firemen were put out because at the end of the day, volunteer firefighting, Tom, in the 19th century uh, is a book unto itself, and it's an incredible history in Philly, in New York, and other places. It's a story of great dedications, but it's also a story of political influence. It's a story of all sorts of things. Uh, it's a story of insurance as well, and so these insurance companies did appreciate um, the fact that we could, you know, that they would, you know, a fire company would see that they would be more, perhaps more incentivized to get water on the fire and put it out, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, they, it was not a situation where they denied putting a fire out, but it probably did incentivize at least some of the companies to maybe do a little bit more quicker, a little bit more aggressive and put water on the fire. Mm. There you have it, the story of the fire mark, because uh, there's a lot of people have them, but not many people really know the true story of what they're about. And so. Right, and there's original ones out there. If any of your listeners look around, uh, there's a book has been written on the American fire marks. Uh, the home insurance company had the largest collection in the United States, which is now part of the New York City Fire Museum uh, in Manhattan on Spring Street. You can see that collection there, at least part of it, on display. Uh, if you're interested in seeing how the fire marks have kind of evolved, because there's books written about it. Um, that's one of the things Thomas should mention while we're discussing it here. One of the things I, I do is um, I recommend books to people to read. Um, in my 25 fires class, fires class, I have a couple slides at the end. There's been books written about most of the 25 fires I've selected, uh, in some cases two or three books, but there's at least one book out there. But for more generic fire history, I mean, there's some generic books that I recommend people start with. And, you know, the NFPA put a book out many years ago. Uh, Lyons was the author in the 70s. I think it was around the bicentennial called Fire in America. It's a good book uh, to get. Another one is As You Pass By uh, by a guy by the name of Paul Dunshee, who worked for the New York, actually worked for the Fireman's Home in Hudson, New York, before he was hired away to work down uh, at uh, the home insurance company. And he wrote this incredible sort of folklorish book about New York City's volunteer fire department, and it's called As You Pass By. Uh, 
John Cannon's book I mentioned earlier, Heritage of Flames. If there's three books I recommend to get a more generic appreciation of American fire history, those are the three books. What's great about today's world, Tom, is that book exchange abe.com, abe.com, is now owned by Amazon. You can you can go into that system and find those books for under five dollars a piece. Okay, and uh, they're incredible reads. So if somebody's thinking about a Christmas gift for somebody right now. Uh, those are three good books that I recommend. There's others out there. There's dozens more that I could recommend, but those are three that is sort of a starting point to understand sort of American fire history. Those are three really good books. And and Glenn, as I look at my bookshelf. I am looking at Heritage of Flames, The Romance of Firefighting, Fire in America, among others, because you influenced me hearing you talk once to go to abe.com and find those books. And you know what? You're absolutely right. I don't think I spent more than $5 on either of them, on any of them. And they are phenomenal. And you're right. Great time of year to talk about it. There's some gift ideas for you people out there. If you have that historian firefighter on your list, they would not be disappointed with those books. I have I have those among many others, and uh, so, so fascinating. And um, the other thing I, I wanted to bring up, too, because I've heard you talk about, and it's a term we use, and uh, it's plug, which I know a lot of people understand. Okay, they used to, they had wooden water lines, and then they would plug it, but... Water was a big deal, um, and, and it even got political with forming water companies to uh, to administer the water lines and things. Who had the first water line? Was it New York? Was it Philly? I, I think it was New York, wasn't it? Yeah, and it's funny because um, we'll get the short version of the history here, but they, after the revolution, the Constitution just signed, so by the 1790s, um, we realize that, you know, to be an economic powerhouse, uh, we've got to sort of create a system where money can be spent and borrowed and stored and things like that. So banks become a really big, important concept. And the problem is, is that there's not a lot of desire in terms of the politicians and what the officials to create these banks because they looked back then, I mean, even today, I mean, not everybody says banks are the greatest thing, but back then banks were looked upon as sort of like not not something that was, you know, it was important, but it was something they didn't want to deal with. And so you get the situation where um, you get the creation, ironically, of the very first water company, um, the Manhattan Water Company in Manhattan in the late 1790s to create a system of water in lower Manhattan, including fire protection. But in reality, of course, historically, we look back and we say, hmm, was it really the water they wanted or did they want to be a place where money could exchange hands as a bank mm. would do? And, of course, it really was a bank. And, of course, if any of you the listeners have been around a while, you know there's a bank called the Chase Bank. Well, it used to be called the Chase Manhattan Bank, and that Manhattan Water Company was the beginnings of the Chase Manhattan Bank. So those water companies were absolute disasters, okay? The water they provided was was nowhere near what was needed. You think about a place like New York or Philadelphia, they're rapidly growing after the revolution. Hundreds of thousands of people moving into these cities, and they're relying on wells, wells for water. And of course, mm. the wells can only produce so much. There's no storage, there's no reservoirs, there's no nothing. And so here they are creating these water, tiny water systems with tiny tents that are 20 feet off the ground they can virtually do nothing. I mean, they're basically wooden water mains with pitch to glue them together. And that's where the term plug, of course, comes from, is that these early water systems did not have any hydrants. They were basically wooden water mains, you know, under the ground, not too far, that if a fire broke out, you literally went with an auger, supposedly. And I, again, there's no, there's real no contemporary information that really talks about this in any detail, but we believe what they did is took augers, drilled into this water main, um, and then basically let the water come out. They throw their draft hose down to this puddle in the, in the street, and they drafted their water out of this puddle, which, of course, it was. They, I, I can't imagine it, was, it, it worked to any great extent. And so, Yeah, how much water could they really be getting? Right, right. 
And so they basically took those, they took plugs, wooden plugs, and jammed them into the hole they dug to, pl- to stop the water from flowing, theoretically, after the fire was out. In 1807, wow. uh, we get the very first hydrant, ironically, on Liberty Street, right where the World Trade Center was, or the New World Trade Center is, not too far from Wayne, right on Liberty Street. We get the very first fire hydrant. So that's where we get threaded hose uh, that we can attach to the engine to, to provide water. But even then, New York City's water system is not very good at all. It's the Great Fire of 1835 that gets New York City off its, off its behind and to create effectively, which has become the world's most extensive, incredibly, uh, for, I mean, you can't imagine the foresight these people had in 1835. To think of what they would need someday in terms of water supply. New York City's water supply system starts as a result of that. They called it the Croton water system, which started off in the Bronx, way, way up. Bronx isn't even is a county. It's not a city. It's not part of New York until 100 years later. I mean, or almost 100 years later. And that has evolved into 2018 into a system of reservoirs and piping that extends all the way to the Delaware water gap. So my yeah. student, John Jay, when we teach hydraulics, they cannot wrap their head around the fact that we have pressure in Manhattan at John Jay College up to the fifth or sixth floor without pumps that literally is hydrostatic pressure created by the Delaware River Basin. <laughs> and it makes it to the fifth or sixth floor? Right. <laughs> it's, it's one continuous stream of water all the way out there. Wow. So anyway, without uh-huh. pumps. Without pumps. So anyway, New York Jeez. City gets its work. The Fairmount Water Company is created in Philadelphia. Probably a little bit more advanced at the time. They really engineer it to the nth detail. But New York City system today is is incredible. And to think they could think that far ahead to create a system that that provides water to almost nine million people every day. <laughs> it's hard to that. But it yeah. starts with that oh, fire. Man. It's the fire that yeah. gets it. Those water co- the early water companies really didn't do anything of any substance. Wow. And what year was Other that fire? Eighteen thirty. Five. What year was the largest? 1835. 1835. Yeah, lower Manhattan. Still impacting us today. Exactly. And if you were standing on the corner of Broad and Wall Street, right by the stock exchange today, if you look to the south and to the east, nothing would have been standing. Nothing would have been vertical after that fire in December of 1835. Another December fire. Another December fire. Wow. Exactly. Wow. Got to jot that down for next year's show in December. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Theater, by the way, night. The Iroquois Theater, the worst public assembly fire in American history, December 1904. So, add that one there too. So. Yeah, yeah, they just, it's so a tragic December month for it, sure. And it is, it is, it is. Something about December. And, you know, I wanted to ask you too, because uh, you mentioned it a few times, and uh, tell our listeners just a little bit about hose, because. Um, there used to be two piece companies, right? I mean, it, you talked about hose companies earlier, but I don't think people truly know what a hose company was, or maybe still is. But the pumpers or the engines maybe carried a section of hard suction, correct, or suction hose, and then the hose had to come from somewhere. So, how'd they get? What was the first hose even made of? Yeah, so the first fire engines sort of then precipitate the need for a fire hose. Because uh, if you want to go any distance, you got to have fire hose. So there's two types of hose we're talking about. Of course, drafting hose, we get that in the late 19th, uh, late 18th century. We get the first hard suction hose because they realize that, hmm, if I put this hose in, in a standing body of water and I use my piston pumper, my piston pumper will move the air out of that like a straw in a glass of, of uh, soda, will move the air out and will let atmospheric pressure push the water up into that drafting hose. I don't know that they understood it that way, but it worked. And so we get the first drafting hose. We also get the first, we'll call them hand lines or, uh, or supply line hose in that same time period. And there's versions of it before that in, in, the, in the Netherlands and other places. But by the late 18th century, we get the first hose, and it's made out of leather, Okay. And that leather hose, of course, is sewn by hand to create the seam in the hose. So as you would imagine, a hose under any a leather hose under any pressure is going to leak like a sieve. And so, year, you know, about 15 years go by until this group of guys in Philadelphia, also volunteer firemen, uh, two guys by the name of Sellers and Pennock, 
realize that hand-sewn leather hose leaks like a sieve. Let's come up with something better. They come up with a copper riveted leather hose, okay? And so that lasts for another 40 or 50 years, okay? And so mm-hmm. what's the problem with leather? As we all know, is that leather, uh, if you, you know, let it dry out, it crumbles, it cracks, and that's the end of your hose. So the most undesirable job in the firehouse would not have been cleaning the privy out back. It would have been the massaging the leather hose in this tal- this incredibly nasty-smelling mix of tallow and other fats and things like that to keep the leather hose pliable. And they gave that to the youngest guy in the fire department, in the fire company. And it was, again, it was a nasty job to do, but it was an incredibly necessary job to do. The very first engines, uh, the hand engines, that, like the new shim and stuff like that, they had the capacity for maybe 50 feet of hose, 100 maybe tops, 100 feet of hose. That's all they could carry in that center area between the brakes. There wasn't a lot of room for hose storage. So the very first hose company is created in Philadelphia as well, uh, 1803, I believe. Very first fire uh, hose company in which they would become the supply lines and to a certain extent the hand lines of the engine company. So they created separate fire companies, a Philadelphia hose company um, in New York, uh, and, and, of course, there were dozens created in Philadelphia. It became a craze in the, in the early 19th century to create these hose companies. You get – there's more hose companies in Manhattan by 1865 when they go out than there are engine companies, okay? So the mm-hmm. hose companies evolved over time in which they had hose reels, and they could carry more and more leather hose as time went on. By the, by the 1850s, we start getting steam engines again, we mentioned – the problem is leather hose does not hold up well under these incredibly powerful boilers on wheels, basically, with their pumps. And so we get the very first introduction of India rubber hose, ru- solid rubber fire hose. We get the very first cotton jacketed hose and the canvas hose in those days. So the hoses are, are, are by the 1850s, hoses start to change. And, of course, we still need hose companies even with steam fire engines, right? There's no hose reel on a steam fire engine. So hose companies, even in the paid departments, in the paid, like Philly and New York, they continue to have a, not a separate company, but a separate hose reel for that engine company that went with the engine because you need to have the hose to go with it. And, of course, Tom, back in those days, there was a one-size-fits-all hose, and that was the two-and-a-half-inch hose line. That's the size all, they all were. We don't get inch and a half until the 20th century. We don't get inch and three quarter until John Taylor Hagen used to be So there's one size fit all, all hose. There's no LDH. There's no storage couplings. We literally have two and a half inch that, that we used from literally from the early 19th century right up until pretty much until World War II. So for wow. well over 100 years, two and a half inch hose is the hose of choice. Your uh, your phone cut out there just as you were saying oh, when okay. the inch and three quarter came. When did inch and three quarter come into the fire service? Seventies. Yeah, sixties and seventies. So John T. O'Hagan, commissioner of the FDNY, one of the most progressive fire chiefs and commissioners ever to walk the planet. Uh, he's the guy who gets us better at CPA. He's the guy who gets us all the modern fire high rise fire protection techniques and fire fighting techniques. He literally writes the book called High Rise Fire and Life Safety. Um, he's the guy who is, is a guy, really strong guy behind smoke detectors. Um, he's a guy that's just an innovator on every level, okay, of every conceivable kind of thing. But one of the things he invents is the inch and three quarter hose because he's attempting to cut the number of firefighters down on a, on a hand line to a more manageable uh, hand line a smaller diameter. He realizes that if I take inch and three quarter hose and um, I mix in my water stream, I mix light, what we would call light water or a surfactant additive. Um, you know, foam, of course, follows the same characteristics, but you realize that I don't want so much more foam. I want an additive um, that he called rapid water in FDMY terminology, a rapid water in which I could cut the size of the hose from two and a half down to to inch and three quarter. I could take one firefighter off that hose line and I could pump it at a higher pressure to compensate for the smaller diameter hose with the friction loss, but also 
put that additive in there, that combination would give me uh, would give me some economic benefits to the FDNY because this is a time period uh, where the war years are started in New York City, where they went to their highest levels of response ever in the recorded history, hundreds of thousands of responses each year. Uh, you know, the Bronx is burning. This is the war, they call them the war years. This is the this is the midst of all this because he's realizing the city doesn't have enough money to staff all these companies, so he's closing firehouses, you know, against to his to his wishes. He's closing houses and he's trying to figure out a way of making a fire company as effective as possible using essentially the same equipment but with one fewer firefighter. So I'm not arguing against this or for this. I'm just saying that's the re that was the that was right. the context in which this hose was developed. And so we lived yeah. Yeah. with Two and a half inch hose, literally up until World War II. It's the Navy, of course, that gives us inch and a half hose, but it's, it's John T. O'Hagan that gives us inch and two quarter hose. Oh, fascinating. And again, there's a reason and a story for pretty much everything we do and use in the fire service. And um, I just real quick want to have you, I'm going to throw a couple terms out at you, and I just want you to show the listeners or tell the listeners how they apply today and where they come from. And the first one is runs. How many runs does your department go to? How many runs did you have last year? That term comes from yesteryear, correct? Right. And it's if you think about in the 19th century, we have hand engines um, that are heavy, right? That man killer, the 60, 60 men to pump it, man killer. That thing was over two tons. Okay, <laughs> so you needed not horses, but you needed men. Because believe me, the men did not want the horses. Okay, because even get this, Tom. Even FDN or the NYFD, that's New York Volunteer Fire Department, they never had horses in their entire history up to 1865. Even the steam fire engines, they they pulled by hand. There were reels of, mm. of rope at the front end on the tongue. The tongue is, of course, we used to use that term today, too. That's the steering mechanism that we can steer the apparatus with. Under the tongue was a long, long rope on reels. And as you pulled out of the firehouse, you you extended that rope out, and you would put 20, 30 firefighters pulling that engine with a, with the with the more sophisticated, more experienced firefighter at the tongue, the the, the the uh, the guy, the whip, if you want to call him in the fire company, the guy, the most experienced, he's the guy that gets to control the tongue, okay, because that's more important. Pulling is, is that where the term top whip steering. comes from? Yeah, to some extent, because the whip, of course, is the guy that, you know, we, in the career departments, we use them as, uh, they don't use that term so much anymore, but that's the most experienced guy in the firehouse, right? So Isn't that a term that on the, in the House of Representatives still? <laughs> yes, it Isn't is. Isn't that a political is term? I think it is. Yeah. Things. Right. It's, it's the guy who controls things. So the guy who controlled the tongue is the guy that directed that apparatus. Even though the other guys are pulling it, he's directing it, right? It's where it's going, turning corners, jumping sidewalks, whatever. But to get back to your original question here, for the entire period, the volunteer departments in the big cities never used horses, okay? They used mm-hmm. manpower. And, of course, you had to run to go to the firehouse. You had to run to the fire scene with your apparatus. So that's, we <laughs> and then used pump the word run in some all cases. the time. They literally did that. They literally ran. And so, because if you think about it, think about anything else in, in society. I mean, you don't think about anything else ever, for the most part, running. I mean, you know, you know what I'm saying in terms of any other kind of profession. You know, there's no runs right. in doctors. There's no runs in tow truck operators, as Rick Lasky would say. There's no runs in anything else yeah. other than the fire department. Because that's literally how they got from the firehouse to the fire seat, was they ran. Wow. That's a term that still applies today. Yeah. Um, turnout gear. Right. Bunker gear, right? Right, right. Right, so we get the very first bunkers, because there's bunks in the firehouse, is not in the career department. It's actually in the volunteer front. So we got the very first bunkers they call them, in the firehouse in New York City by the late 1850s, early 1860s. And so America 6, again, that the engine company of Boss Tweed, you know, the, the um, Gangs of New York movie, which, by the way, Tom, is a total fallacy, okay? Anybody who watched that movie, 
uh, they did not have a technical director on that movie. Okay, they didn't provide any <laughs> Remember that, people. Do anything. not get your fire history from that movie. <laughs> right, because even though it's exciting and all those kind of things, it most of the fire part of that is totally false. Okay, you know they mm-hmm. love showing the firefighters fighting, which they did. Philadelphia was a much more uh, brutal fire department to be in for fighting than New York actually was. Ironically, there were fights in New York all the time. But most of the fights in New York did not bring guns to the equation, okay? In Philly, they brought guns to their fights, okay? So, anyway, to go back to your story about bunkers, it's the, the America 6 is one of the first companies that furnishes their firehouse with bunks literally on the upper floor. And so young guys would live in the firehouse. And, and Tom, you talked about volunteer firefighter elections. I've been the victim and perhaps in some of those situations myself. Uh, I don't want to call myself a victim, but I, believe me, I understand the politics of the firehouse, okay? Can you imagine an, being an older America 6 firefighter and having these young guys never been done before living in the firehouse, okay? Mm-hmm. Can you imagine mm-hmm. the issues of having firemen there at 2 o'clock in the morning living in the firehouse, okay? Mm-hmm. So it was not a well-received concept, okay? Uh, although it was permitted, uh, the famous Harry Howard of the, the second-to-last volunteer fire chief, perhaps the most beloved fire chief in its volunteer fire department's history, he's the guy who gets the fireman's home and Hudson actually created so one last thing, Tom, about – let me just diverge and tangent here for a second. New York and New Jersey, oh, go ahead. I, believe, I believe, are the only two states in this country which offer a home to volunteer firefighters. If they're indigent, out of money, uh, sick or whatever, they are allowed to go into the home. In New York, it's in Hudson, New York, New Jersey. It's in Booton, New Jersey. I am actually on the Bergen County Home Association. We raise additional funds. But in both states – uh, New Jersey and New York, a portion of the insu- fire insurance policy sold in both states is directed toward the State Farmers Association, Volunteer Fire Association, and specifically toward the homes in both states. So you can go, if if you serve as a volunteer farm in New York and New Jersey, uh, and I don't know, in New Jersey it's one year, you serve one year, you're entitled to go to that home any time in your life. Maybe 50 years later, you need a home you don't have family, whatever, you can you can basically burn into the home and risk, live out the rest of your life there. Um, what, the reason I mentioned all this is that Harry Howard was not a big fan of bunkers, okay? He believed that it, it created too much of, an, of a recipe for alcohol, near the wells, you know, all sorts of problems. Mm-hmm. And, and to some extent, it, he was proven true because by the 1860s, right even through the Civil War, the New York City Volunteer Fire Department was a difficult department to control, control. Imagine, Tom, you being a chief of volunteer fire department with six or 7,000 volunteer firemen. Can you imagine that? I mean, 6, we complained 7, about 000. 100 guys. Can you, can you <laughs> right. imagine? We complained about a volunteer fire department with 100 guys in the problem. Right. That. Imagine being the chief of that department. Anyway, he wasn't a big fan of it, but it did start there. And, of course, the, I personally, I believe this to be true because I can never prove it, Tom. But the fact that career paid firemen are allowed to sleep on the job is because of those bunkers, okay? Those bunking in the firehouse, it was accepted that firemen need to be at the ready, that we need to be there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 a year, and that we need to let them rest to be energized to go ready for that call, okay? And mm-hmm. those bunkers, those young guys in the 18, late 50s and early 60s, that create a concept of living in the firehouse, okay? And that continues in career departments to this day. And, mm-hmm. it's, of course, Tom, a lot of career guys, I, of course, I you know, have them in my class. I, you know, of course, I deal with them all the time and stuff. We get along really well. And sometimes I have to remind some of them, though, that their fire department started as volunteer fire departments, okay? Yes. Most yes. Paid career fire departments don't start off as career fire departments, okay? One of the shortest ones mm-hmm. on record is San Francisco. They went from, from volunteer in 1850 to 20. Wow. Pretty much every big city fire department started as volunteers. And sure. they were created for sure. a variety of reasons. And one was because managing a group of six or 7,000 people is an impossible task, you know? <laughs> and so, yeah. ironically, the FDNY itself today is 10,000 firefighters strong. So they are managing that many firefighters in five boroughs now, not one borough. 
So right. it's a history tool this time, right? And um, and so for our new firefighters, so we can talk about the beginning of the program. This is this is important stuff to understand that you know as a new firefighter, you didn't just land in something that was just created yesterday. There's a long history, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why. Gee, why don't we do things that way, or why don't we do things this way? It's because of tradition. And yet, Tom, you and I can, and our listeners can always joke about you know the the, the you know seeing that back draft movie that. That post on the wall, you know, 150 years of tradition unimpeded by progress, <laughs> right? We can <laughs> yep. say that, but 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 really, though, that tradition is what it makes us where we are today. The fact that we have good technology, improved techniques, better ways of doing things is because the traditions have said, you've got to show me what you're doing is much better than what I'm doing right now. So that tradition sets the, the precipice for which we can make improvements because we don't just decide to change things willy-nilly. Listen, we all have dealt, dealt with fire officers and stuff in departments where they've done things that we went back to going the original way we did things because there's proven uh, technology and proven procedures in tradition, right? So we do that for right. a long time. It works. We don't want to change things if we don't have to. Right, but sometimes we've got to move out of the way. Listen, the, one of the most important things ever created is a thermal imaging camera. The guys in the 1860s could never conceive of such a product, and how we change the fire service, you know. So mm-hmm. listen, we 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 are don't don't be fooled by that quote. Know that that's an tradition's important part of our history here, and it's because yeah. we do we've. Listen, we do things – I mean, we can complain about how good we are, how bad we are, but the fact is that we don't have really have conflagrations anymore, which wipe out entire cities. It could happen, but we don't – it doesn't happen. We're much better today than we've been ever probably in our history. And it's because we built upon the sh- – you know, as, as I say, building on the shoulders of firefighters of the past. We we keep improving things by modifying things. So, yeah. so, again, so important. what we've talked so about tonight is, and- is incredibly important, right? Yeah, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I could talk to you about so much more, so we are definitely going to have to do a second show. But one more quick yeah. question, because I wanted to get this. Yes. Because I hear this mistake all the time. Here's something yep. that is definitely still with us today, and that's the collar insignia. Are they trumpets? Are they horns? Are they bugles? <laughs> I know that's Chief okay. Lasky's ire, too. <laughs> Where did they come from? So. They were never called bugles when they were created, okay? So we can throw that word out. So if somebody uses the word bugle, that's in, inappropriate. And trumpets or horns are both acceptable terms. And where do they come from? They come from the famous Hang on, Glenn, I'm losing you there. I don't know if you're moving okay. a foot. Oh, okay. I think I got well, you back. J- okay. Jacob is Turk, that guy we talked about a while back here in our conversation. Yep who creates the very first fire helmet, we credit him with creating the very first tollware or tin-type speaking trumpet, okay, or speaking mm-hmm. horn. And basically it was to, of course, amplify the voice of an officer giving orders. The, the, the maritime industry, of course, used the ship captains also use them. And so they're identical in, in appearance because they need to give orders, and that megaphone was a way to do that. And, of course, in our world, that those trumpets, those horns were only given to officers. So as time went on, I thought, hmm, how do we, you know, how do we, how does this connect to us in terms of insignia and stuff? Well, you would think that the volunteer fire departments who use these horns would use them on their regalia, on their insignia. But ironically, it's the paid departments who take that tech technology the coal technology of the fire horn, the brass trumpet uh, megaphone, they're the ones who adopt that as as the basis for uh, insignia for various officers. So if you're a lower-ranking officer, you get one trumpet. If you're two, you get, you know, if you're a little bit higher up, you get two, three, four, five, all the way up to five, okay? And so it's the career departments, and particularly FDNY, who, who take that as their insignia to represent the level of fire officer they were. Because to tell you the truth, even the FDNY, I don't know about Philly, I'd have to do some research, but I know FDNY continued to use trumpets for another perhaps uh, five or six, seven years because 
In 1865, when FDNY comes, or excuse me, when the Metropolitan Fire Department comes into existence, they actually issue all their officers brass trumpets because they were literally most of these guys were vol- former volunteer firefighters. Now we're career professional, we'll call them professional career firefighters, right? So mm-hmm. those guys, it's because that's what they knew, and I don't know who it is, if it's Shaler or one of the FDNY commissioners who's an ex-military guy, I think he understood that how that was a symbol of authority, and it's there, it's, it starts there in 1865, we get our first horns on equipment, okay, in terms of helmet fronts, uh, insignia and stuff, that's where it starts in 1865. So, and they still even exist concept, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's a volunteer concept, it's the career department, specifically FDNY, who creates that as a symbol of authority, and of course, it's universally adopted throughout the entire fire service and used to this day. So, yeah. even though it's a volunteer deal, it actually is adopted by the career guys, and that's where it starts. Wow, wow! Again, just highlighting how things we use today had right. their beginning or were influenced hundred or hundreds years. of years ago. Fascinating. Exactly. So exactly. much more that we could talk about. I probably right. kept you longer than you expected and wanted to, and I, I, I appreciate it so much. Um, definitely we'll talk about a future show because one thing yeah. I want to talk about is some more of these terms, red lights on yeah. firehouses, where the right. FDNY comes from because everyone wants to know why is it FDNY and not NYFD and so many right. other things to talk about, why we have red predominantly red fire apparatus and also one thing we didn't get to the fires of uh the the reason we do things today that sometimes we complain about like fire drills and fire inspections and how important they are because people died that made us make these changes for the better including in my own hometown cheek new york there was that a school fire in 1954 They killed a bunch of children, 13 children, I believe. And uh, that's what, one of the reasons we have fire drills today. And, right. Uh, exactly. But anyway, we're going to we're gonna get you back on here, Professor Corbett. And uh, for the listeners out there, people wanted to reach out to you, had questions, uh, wanted some more information on history. Would you, would you share the best way that, uh, that uh, people could get a hold of you? Yeah, sure. I mean, the easiest one probably is to go to Fire Engineering's website because if you go to the um, uh, editorial section there, it's got the listing of all the editors and stuff like that. So I'm on there, but I'm also at John Jay. They can email me either way, the John Jay address. So if if, if somebody's got a pencil, paper, want to write this down, it's Glenn Corbett, two N's and two T's. Glenn Corbett at optonline.net. That's Glenn Corbett, two N's and two T's at optonline.net. Or G Corbett, G C O R B E T T, two T's at J J A Y dot CUNY, C O N Y dot EDU. So that's G Corbett at J J A Y dot CUNY, C O N Y dot EDU. They can go either way. I'll get e- both emails um, and I'll try to help. I get some questions I can't answer, Tom. So uh, I'll, I, I, I'll dig down deep. I'll look at some books and uh, I'll try, but sometimes. Things are just lost history. The Dalmatian is one of those, too. So we can talk about the next episode of that. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But but one thing I, I really want to point I just want to make is that for the folks out there that are maybe Tom, you and I have, in, have engaged them, they've got interest in their own local history and stuff, we're fortunate that um, Fine Engineering Magazine is now available available back to 1877, our very first issue, digitally, and we call the vault. And so if anybody's interested uh, you can go into the vault, do a quick search on your own department, you know, Chicatawagua or Waldwick or whatever, and any article that's been in there will come up. Now, it's a subscription to that. They, I think they give you a couple free ones to look at what it looks like, but literally every article has been digitized now and clipped out. So if you're looking for your own fire department uh, and you're looking for your history, when did we buy that hose reel somewhere around 1905? It's very possible that that stuff is in those early, early magazines and stuff. So I, I, wow. I, I ask you, uh, or is a, an advocate that you go and look in there for the heck of it. Just one Saturday afternoon, just for the heck of it, Google the, you know, in the vault. Uh, it's on the Fire Engine website. You can find the archives. It's called the archives, 
uh, you can look in there and see what you can find because you, you'll probably find some stuff you have no idea even existed. So it's a helpful yeah. tool. Um, and uh, just to make guys aware of that and stuff. So it was only what an incredible resource, ago. right? Because wow. the only other place it exists on Route 208 in Fairland, New Jersey, across from Nabisco, the Nabisco the plant that makes Barnum's uh, uh, cookies and I think Oreos there. <laughs> right across from that factory, as far as near his office was in Fairland, and we were the only ones that had that complete run of magazines back all the way to the beginning, 1877. So That's anyway, it's a great it's a great app set and. Uh, uh, the folks listening might want to take a look at it. So, and check Texas, out Abe as well. A- Abe.com, was yep. it? Or old books? Yep, abe.com. Yep. And uh, Google what you, you know, look up what kind of books we talked about there, and you'll be, I'm sure you'll find what you're looking for. <laughs> oh, fantastic. And, you so, know, I want to leave with one quote here that I took yep. from FDIC a couple of years ago. There's a chief uh, down in uh, in Rick Lasky's uh, department that he was chief of in Louisville, Texas. Perhaps you've met uh, Jerry Wells. Yeah. He's a, a yeah. battalion chief down there, and he he talks yep. about history and the importance of understanding it. And he's got a, a cute little line that I've borrowed from him, and it's it's just know your why, know your why, yep. why you yep. exist as a firefighter, why your department exists, why you do things a certain way, and yep. it, it's just. It might not make you a more skilled firefighter, but my gosh, knowing something right. about our profession, a little bit more about it, it does make you a little bit better firefighter. And uh, exactly. Professor Corbett, thank you so very much for taking the time to out of your extremely busy schedule to uh, accommodate me and, and be on the show. And, and I will definitely reach out to you because I could fill another hour and a half, two hours with you in the future for sure. That'd be great, Tom. Thanks for having me, and uh, Merry Christmas Absolutely. to everyone, and uh, Happy Holidays, and uh, uh, we'll be talking soon. So thank you. So All much. right, thank you so much, and Merry Christmas to you and your family as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, just what a great show! What a great show! And I, I got to tell you, people, I've got notes uh, that I didn't even get to. Uh, that so much involving our fire service history, and, and hopefully, for those that maybe didn't have it, it just ignites a little bit of passion in you to. To, to maybe do some more research, to maybe look at these books, Heritage of Flame, The Romance of Firefighting, Fire in America, among others. Um, understand your own department's history, and it's so important. Don't let what has happened in so many departments happen in your department, that when you get close to an anniversary, you have nothing put together. Start somewhere. And I am going to do a show in the future as well on ideas for preserving your history, where to start, how to preserve it, because um, I've talked to some people and learned some great ideas and learned from my own successes and failures on what works and what doesn't. But, oh, my gosh, as as I talked about earlier, understanding the fires of the past is so important. We didn't even get to that tonight. We're going to talk about some of the fires that impacted, that still impact us today, whether it's due to codes or rules or running fire drills and oh there's just so so much and um oh, we're going to do it again we're going to do it again so my next show is scheduled for tuesday january 29th and who knows maybe we'll do history part two we'll see what uh, professor corbett's schedule is like but got a lot of other things uh in the works as well so we'll definitely have a show for you tuesday january 29th and Again, start making plans now for FDIC 2019, which will be April 8th to the 13th in Indianapolis. Um, Scholarship opportunities, I believe they're still available. Visit fireengineering.com or fdicscholarship.com for more information on that. If you want to reach out to me, uh, please feel free to email me at tamerrill63 at aol.com. I'm on Twitter. Uh, please give my Professional Volunteer Fire Department Facebook page uh, a look over and a like button, and you can contact me through that. I'm always posting information about our great volunteer fire service and sharing stories and quotes and, and information as well. And um, I'd like to do uh, what I do at the end of uh, most shows, and that's a shout-out. Um, and tonight it's a generic shout out to all the newly elected and reelected officers or soon to be newly elected or reelected officers. I want to thank you and give you a shout out for stepping up, for volunteering to do just a little bit more to move your department forward. And no matter 
what side of the department you serve, administrative or firematic operational, strive to serve with passion, serve with wisdom, serve with integrity, serve with honor, and work every day yourself a better firefighter. And remember, there are a lot of people that are looking up to you to guide them and protect them, help keep them safe, and to help keep your department operating proficiently. But I want to give you a kudos, job well done, congratulations. Thank you for stepping up to lead your department in no matter what officer role it is and serve with honor and integrity and use the lessons from the great late President George Bush about doing the right thing and serving with honor and integrity. Thank you for joining us tonight. I wish you and your families, that's both the fire department family and your own personal family, a very joyous, a very happy, a very healthy holiday season. Let's all strive to be even better as a firefighter in 2019. Let's all strive to uphold our professional obligation and, again, exemplify what the late President George Bush told us and strive to teach us, and that's serving with honor and to be gracious and kind and to truly respect one another. Thanks for tuning in tonight. I really appreciate it, and please stay safe. And please remember that developing, maintaining, and upholding a professional reputation is the duty and the responsibility of all firefighters, whether paid or volunteer. Thanks, folks.